Welcome to episode 264 of the Asota Calibers podcast, the second on podcast. There's a little bit for everyone. I'm Weird Beard, and tonight I'm a little bit sleepy. And who's also sleepy with me tonight is the greatest hostess ever, Aaron Pallett. How you doing, Aaron? I'm tired, Weird. Mostly I'm tired of people being ugly to each other. I'm tired of all the pain I feel and hear in the world every day. There's too much of it. Hands down, the best book Stephen King ever wrote. Fight me. <laughs> I love The Green Mile. Oh, such a good movie. Such a good book. And the movie was just, I mean, it's its so rare. I, I have taken to, if I find out that a, a, a book by an author that I like or a book that the, the subject that I like, uh, is being made into a movie. It used to be I would like rush out and grab the book and try to read it before the movie m- movie comes out. Uh, and now I do do the exact opposite is I just go, you know what? I'll watch the movie and then I'll read the book because I have found that if I read a book that is uh, a, a re- read a book that is tied to a movie that I've already seen, I will find that overall it expands and compares and contrasts. And overall I've, you know, I'll go, yeah, I really like this book better. Or in some cases, you know what this, the movie actually did that a little bit better. I liked how that went through, but boy, like m- good movies that I absolutely hate. Uh, speaking of Stephen King, the Shawshank Redemption is one of the greatest examples. It's not a bad movie. Like, there's nothing about that movie that's terrible unless you read the book first, and then it makes me angry. <laughs> and so I find that overall, the best solution is to watch the movie first and then and then read the book. And since there tends to be much more information, it, it feels like it's like a director's cut. Mm-hmm. So there is one movie which I think is superior to the book. I could probably name a couple, but but let me hear yours. Well, I figured you'd know exactly what I was talking about, and I paused so that you could jump in and name it. Uh, is it Watchmen? Because I figured you'd be all, ooh, ooh, Mr. Carter, Mr. Carter, ooh. And, and you didn't, and that surprised me. So what did you say? Watchmen. No, no, no. Uh, the, the movie was not better. Okay. I, 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 I will argue with you on that one. I don't have the energy to give a damn. I understand. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, um, the one situation, there might be another one that I'm just not thinking of, but the only one that I'm thinking of uh, where the movie was better than the book was Fight Club. Yeah. I, you know what? I kind of put them on the, the same level. Those, that's ones where I think the, I think the, the, uh, the book is better in certain instances and the, and, and the movie is better, uh, better in others. And I also, that was also an instance where I watched the movie first. So therefore I find them to be very complimentary of each other. Mm. So yeah, I, I, I could absolutely see where you got that. And I, I would, I would note on uh, for for Watchmen as 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 my defense is number one, the uh, the the ending, the fact that they t- the Cthulhu ending for uh, uh, for for the uh, for the Alan Moore graphic novel of Watchmen was extremely dumb, and I liked the uh, I, I I liked I liked the, the ending in the Zack Snyder movie better, and then furthermore, mm-hmm. I found that uh, that. Uh, um, do I? Sp- I'm not going to spoil anything, but I will just say that that in 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 the Zack Snyder one, one character is very clearly a villain, and another one is very clearly a hero, and they are swapped in the in, in the book as as far as how 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 I read it because of the difference in political philosophies between the director and the author, and uh, and so I well, I I think perhaps. I have not fully communicated um, just because I don't think the movie Watchmen is better than the comic book Watchmen doesn't mean that I think the comic book is better than the movie. I think that they are both very strong in some places, and I think that they are also very weak in some places. 
Uh, I agree with you that the movie uh, version of the ending was superior to the comic book. But um, just to pull something out of the top of my head, um, the bit where Night Owl and Silk Spectre had sex in the movie, look, I'm Mm -hmm. far from a prude, but that contributed nothing to the movie. And in fact... For reasons I'm not really clear on, I felt creepy and uncomfortable watching it. <laughs> and yes. so it's just like, okay, yeah, we didn't need that. Th- you know, those however many minutes could be spent on better things. Yes, like if- explaining why Nixon was still president for three terms or something, you know? Just, uh, anyway. If, if the movie in question is not a, porno- a pornographic picture, then then sex scenes need to happen for a reason. They de- they need to further the plot, mm-hmm. and that one did not further the plot. Yeah, it's like okay, they're they're having sex, fine. You know, they embrace, things get a little hot. We do a tasteful fade to black. It, it was it was <laughs> not it was not quite as bad as the sex scene from the movie Ice Pirates, <laughs> to which I re- often refer to as a sex scene written 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 and, written and shot entirely by a virgin. <laughs> this is just what it'll be like. <laughs> Oh, that movie is really hilarious. But uh but yeah, it was it was definitely one of those like okay, the the the, the person the person who wrote that wrote, wrote that sex scene definitely read a few books about sex. <laughs> but uh you know, this goes hand in hand with something else I've said and I know I will get disagreement with you on this. Because you like uh, porn movies with the plot, and I don't, because when I watch porn, uh, I want to watch sex. I I don't want to watch their crappy plot and crappy acting. You know, if if I want to watch a bank heist, I will watch a bank heist movie. I will watch Ocean's Eleven. I'm not going to watch a porn for that. For the same reason, if I want to watch people having sex, I'm not going to watch Watchmen. I'm going to watch pornography. It's just, I, I'm, I'm not a prude. It's just, you know, th- put things in the category where they belong. It, to me, it's right up there where, not that this has ever happened, but to me, but I understand this is a very common thing for foodies. When you Google a recipe and the first three pages are people telling you a story about their their grandmother and when they went on vacation and you're just going, get to the recipe. That's oh. me watching a sex scene in a movie or watching a plot in a porn. It's just, get to the thing I came for. Oh, I, yeah, I, I hate the yeah the foodie stories at the beginning because it's one of those like i might be interested in your story but the first thing i want to see is does your recipe suck and as someone who cooks a lot if i read your ingredients and your and and and, and your uh, and your cooking instructions i could very quickly determine if your recipe sucks or not and i will see it it just <laughs> yes i was I, I was born a young child on the piedmont i don't need any of this <laughs> <laughs> Boy, we've gone off the rails. But honestly speaking, this is actually I don't know if this was intentional. I, I assume you're as, you're as tired as I am that it probably wasn't, but uh I actually put in the show notes about I I I, I walked I wa- I walked into my bedroom and my wife was watching a movie and uh she went, Oh man, the gun control scene in this is so hilarious. And I went Oh, is this the American president? And she goes, yeah. I said, yeah, I never saw that one, but I know that I bl- I'm pretty sure the Brady campaign, I, I did a little bit of research. I couldn't find any direct information, but I also couldn't find as much about the Brady campaign's involvement in in movies as a whole. I know they did it and I know it happened, but uh, they're, they're a little hush-hush about it, <laughs> probably because it didn't work. But uh, the American president was one of those those uh, movies and TV shows from the mid to late nineties that had a, a heavy handed gun control message. Uh, you know, another great one. Lethal Obviously, weapon two was the other. What was that Aaron? Lethal weapon two was another. Oh, le- three. 
three. Lethal Weapon two was the uh, oh. was the South African uh, was was the South African apartheid one. But Lethal Weapon three was Richard Donner. It, it's in the direct in the in the uh, director's commentary track. Richard Donner talks about working directly with the Brady campaign, and all through the police uh, police station, there are Brady campaign posters all over the walls. So yeah, no that that, that was okay. that was firmly a uh, an anti gun hit piece. Another one was um, uh, Runaway Jury. That was a uh, that was a John that was based on a John Grisham novel, which was a tobacco lawsuit, and they changed it to a uh, uh, a, a firearm. A, a, a it was an they were they were suing an FFL who was uh, doing like massive amounts of straw buying, and uh, and the gun that they put in. <laughs> So, who, whoever designed the fire the, the evil the evil firearm for that saw a saw a gun in a picture once uh but that movie was <laughs> hilarious but also a really well well acted and directed movie so like there's a lot there's a lot to gain from from runaway jerry i love that movie the american president was not <laughs> that it was it was i i for those that listen to the ACP blooper reel you will you'll hear Aaron and i discussing this and a few other movies but Oh my God. It was just so poorly written and the characters just did not fit. And it was so ham handed and also hilariously like the whole subplot is he's trying to get an assault weapons ban passed. And it was only because the, the writing and the pre-production took so long in the time that it took them to write the movie, uh, do, do rewrites, get it shot and then, uh, and then get it published. The assault weapons ban had, had, had come into law and been in effect for like a year. So <laughs> it was, it was very, very silly. And, uh, yeah, but, uh, and, and really not that great a movie. So unless, unless you're like me and just want to be like, oh my God, this movie is so dumb. <laughs> my advice on the American president don't. So, uh, speaking of don't, as we leap into our main topic here, um, don't kill people over flags, you idiots. Mm-hmm. Yeah, did, what do you mean by that, Aaron? Do, do, well, do you want, okay, do you want to tackle so, this story? I, I was until you interrupted me. Yes, pardon me. Uh, so, <laughs> so last week a woman was murdered over a pride flag, and according to the article, and I, look, I'm going to admit I haven't done a whole lot of digging into this because, as I said before, I'm tired of people being awful to each other. And we've got more awful coming up in the main topic, believe me. And so what happened was uh, there is a man who took issue uh, over a woman flying uh, the queer pride flag at her clothing store. And now I don't know um, if this woman herself was queer. I kind of doubt it because uh, she is... Uh, 66 years old, uh, married with a husband and nine children. I suppose she could be trans and she adopted the kids. I suppose she could be bisexual, but it's just as likely that she is uh, an ally and flying the flag in solidarity. But that's, that's not the important part. The important part is that she had this flag, which she was displaying in her store, And a man came in, and he really took issue with her having that flag. And he tore down the pride flag and and yelled homophobic slurs at her before shooting her. And that's really all the detail I have. I don't know if he just said something and then bang, 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 or if she tried to wrestle the flag out of his hands, but... That doesn't matter. The point being is an angry man came in uh, and decided that he was going to be someone else's problem that day. And he shot an innocent woman uh, over displaying a rainbow flag. Now, this is awful. And I mean, that that enough is kind of a reason to talk about it. But here's the 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 kicker to this. Um. This shooting happened in California, in in San Bernardino. And I want to bring that up because uh, please remember that not only is California supposed to be one of the most tolerant and welcoming states, uh, 
And, well, maybe it is, but that doesn't mean hate crime doesn't exist. But remember, also, California, I don't remember if they've got the top score from Brady in terms of gun control uh, legislation, but they are a very gun control hungry state. And, you know, we've been assured time and time again that, you know, uh, murders happen with reduced frequency in states with strict gun control laws. And, well, uh, <laughs> you know, both of those assertions uh, were proven false in this particular incident. Now, what I will say, the good, no, not really the good news, but uh, so what happened is after he murdered this poor woman, uh, he fled the scene. And when the police officers uh, caught up with him and confronted him about a mile from the scene, um, he shot at them. And the police justifiably shot back and shot him dead. And so at least we're not going to have to sit through uh, a trial about this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But, but um, yeah, even in places with strict gun control where you're told that you're safe, you're not safe because, well, I don't really want to say safety is an illusion, but safety and freedom exists at opposite ends of the poles. Uh, real freedom is scary. And the safer you are, the less freedom you have. I believe I've said before that I can make you very incredibly safe by locking you in uh, solitary confinement for the rest of your life. And so long as you are brought food and water and your various medical needs are attended to, you'll be completely safe. But you really won't be living. You will not be happy because you won't be free. And so freedom comes with risks. And so, um, you know, the next time someone says, you don't need a gun, you've got all these gun laws, laugh at them. Mm -hmm. And and again, uh, don't, don't kill people over their flags. That's idiotic. Just don't. <sighs> uh, yeah, I'm I'm starting to get depressed here. I mean... Okay, people who know me know that I believe in justifiable homicide, you know, lethal self-defense. But this was stupid. This was stupid and wrong and wasteful on so many levels. Just don't, okay? We mm, Things have been bad, personally for me, because of this attitude against queer people since, like, late February, early March. Okay, this is just another sign of this. Please stop. Please, please stop. <laughs> Yeah, especially since take it away weird. Yeah, th I mean, yeah, and and, and all, all you're doing is just widening the divide. So, mm -hmm. which I mean, probably this prick didn't care one bit about that. Widen the divide all they want, but uh, yeah, it's it, it it it's senseless. It's miserable, and yes, it's it's in California where you know these things aren't supposed to happen, but uh, but they sure do on so many levels. And, uh, yeah, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll move to the next, you know, sunny piece of news. Uh, he said with high amounts of irony is in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, interestingly enough on the, on, on the, ex like, I think five year anniversary of another, uh, spree killing, which yeah, that I, I don't know if that's a coincidence or not a, uh, a man who had put, a bunch of white supremacy scrawl on his uh, his rifle went into a Dollar General and uh, started shooting the place up, killing three people, uh, and then uh, and then took off. And then I believe he got into a shootout with the police. Am I? I may, I'm maybe mixing them up. But uh, well, I don't know if he got into a shootout with the police or the police arrived in time. But the short version is, like so many of these people, he decided to uh, kill himself. Uh, yes, I was. I, before, I, I was. Uh, I was getting the last story arrested. in this one. This this one confused. Yes, this guy, he was shooting up the Dollar General. The uh, the the the, the, pol the police the police arrived and uh, and and he took his own life. Which uh, I'm again, as you said, good. There were. You know, mm -hmm. back, you know, a decade ago when it seemed that like the whole game was shoot as many people as possible until the police show up, then shoot yourself. 
Um, and, it, you know, it's many thankful cases. I mean, I remember there was a, a school shooting in Colorado where the guy opened fire on someone and missed in the hallway and the school resource officer showed up and then uh, and the, the suspect barricaded themselves and after a few minutes decided, yeah, this isn't going to get any better and, and took their own life. So the only person they ended up killing them was themselves. Uh, but I originally thought, oh, it's a shame that we're not bringing them to actual justice. They're going on on their terms. And then these, you know, number of shooters that were apprehended have uh, come about and uh, yeah, no, it's, it's worse that way. Better, better. They just be gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, I want to point out, um, well, I shouldn't say again, but so this shooter used an air 15, like so many others. So, you know, be prepared for that. Uh, what, and, and a, a Glock. So, in addition to the oh let's get of the get rid of the air fifteen we're probably gonna have just get rid of all semi automatic uh firearms because that's what they always go to um it, oh God <laughs> there are things that I want to say, and then I just don't have the effort to say them um so this particular scumbag uh he, he had legally purchased the guns um even though he had been involuntarily committed for a mental health examination. Um, exactly what I was going to br- just bring up. He was, yeah, but because he was released after the examination, I guess that means they examined him and didn't find anything wrong, or at least nothing wrong enough to hold him. Uh, it didn't show up in his background checks. So, I... Yeah, I don't, just, I don't know the mechanics of how that works. It, it, clearly, I mean, the, the Baker Act is, is, is for is for observation and evaluation. Uh, I know specifically the, um, uh, the key to involuntary commitment is to being adjudicated mentally unfit. So therefore a judge will hear over a trial and determine that you are unfit to, uh, uh, to, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're mentally unfit and essentially you're, you're, you're deemed, you're deemed, you know, not guilty by, by insanity, and that's definitely a way to get your um, your rights rights removed. Though even then, uh, the uh, Virginia Tech killer, another one of these people that took their own life, uh, the Virginia Tech computer was adjudicated uh, uh, mentally uh, mentally unfit, was considered a danger to themselves or others. But the judge gave him a lenient sentence and said that he could uh, undergo voluntary mental health uh, treatment, to which. Of course, he did do, and uh, and so because of that, he was able to buy the firearms he had legally. Um, but also, I will say I've I've covered this many times in the weird audio fisks, is that there have been multiple studies where they have done double blind studies where they have had composite spree killers and composite just people with you know you know need for therapy and had the um had licensed therapists and psycholog uh, psychologists and psychiatrists read the profiles and try to determine which ones were dangerous and which ones were not dangerous and they were unable it the it was it was simply chance if they if they guessed correctly so the fact that this person was obviously nuts enough to do a horrific crime like this uh, but w- and was under the care of uh, of of mental health professionals. Uh, that doesn't mean that they t- they drop the ball because there have been multiple studies that have just shown that no, nah, we we can't figure it out. There's obviously some parameters that that are very very common between these spree killers, but these those parameters are not exactly uncommon themselves and many of the people uh that uh, that express those parameters are not violent or dangerous again i note that the the aurora colorado shooter was is now you know was deemed insane and i believe it was schizophrenia was the diagnosis and uh i my i had a relative who who was severely schizophrenic was on disability for the majority of his life 
and uh, he had a lot of problems, and, and it's it, that, that disease is no joke whatsoever, and my heart goes out to anybody who has it or family there of, of those people. It's a very, very difficult disease. But one thing he was not was violent. He never caused any violent problem to people. He, he, his number was blocked with just about every politician in the country, but, uh, but, but nobody, no, no, nobody was ever physically harmed by him. And so, it, it, again, these are there. There's no real predictor to what combination of these mental health diseases result in violence. But it is interesting um, that uh, other- that this person's this person's motivations are being talked about in the news constantly. But yet, there's several shootings where I have heard rumors of what their motivations were, but nobody's talking about it, and that. That bothers me. Yeah. Uh, One thing I want to briefly talk about, and I do mean brief, is that uh, so our Florida governor, Ron DeSantis, uh, showed up and he talked about how this sort of thing, you know, was was a tragedy and we don't have any room for racism in Florida. And just the typical things that you expect a politician to say. And I don't have anything against that. I didn't listen to it. I didn't read it. So I'm not coming at this from a very educated viewpoint. I'm just saying, you know, it it seemed like he was doing that thing that politicians do, and it's kind of expected. Uh, And I I will say that I have very mixed feelings about Ron DeSantis because I like his Second Amendment viewpoint. I dislike a lot of his other viewpoints. Um but he was attacked because he showed up and it was essentially well because you are pro firearm you enabled this uh you know so so blood is on your hands and then of course because um and and then they tied this into wokeness somehow and et cetera. Et cetera. i'm not going to get into that the point being though is even though i'm not terribly a fan of desantis uh he didn't deserve this. You know, if politicians should be able to come in and say, this is a tragedy and we're not going to allow it to happen. Uh, it's when they then get on their soapbox and say other things that I have a problem. And maybe he did. And I just didn't see that. But um, I'm I'm really talking about this because that's one of the things in the show notes. You know, DeSantis booed at vigils. Hundreds mourn the, the racist killings. And so... Um, it, it's just another sign of the division in our country that I'm really tired of. Though, though I will say that there was, there was a civil lining and, and this got played on, on the, uh, on the news this afternoon, uh, that I heard before going through. So I actually heard this quote before, uh, before I put this, uh, the story in the show notes, but, uh, uh, a, a city councilwoman from Jacksonville, uh, I believe it's pronounced Jacoby Pittman, uh, is, uh, is, she stood up and 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 told people to settle down and to stop booing the governor and uh, by the way she's a democrat and she said it ain't about parties today she said a bullet don't know a party and uh, i i found that to be very very you know very very good and unifying i mm-hmm. really appreciated that because yes that's one thing that we hear so often in the you know the debate between the gun prohibitionists and the second amendment activists is you'll hear the gun prohibitionists say oh we're the we're, we're the party of gun safety we're the party we're we're, we're the people that are that are, want to reduce gun violence as if that's not everything that second amendment supporters are saying as well and uh you know, we all want this crap to stop. We all want there to be l- less about it. Well, we're different. Where, where our differences are is our methods, and uh, and so the idea. Yeah, I, and I and I I didn't I I could I in the in the news report I couldn't make out the you know the the jeers from the crowd on what specifically they were go, going against him for, but the. You know, but the idea that because Ron DeSantis is pro Second Amendment means that he was in favor of this guy 
or because Ron DeSantis is of European descent, he's in favor of these, you know, white supremacist pricks. I mean, it's just, it's not fair. It's not good. And, 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 and it's intellectually lazy. Mm-hmm. So, uh, just, you yeah, thank you for pointing out, um, that, that statement by, by Ms. Uh, Jacoby. I had missed that. And that, is is a very small uh, lift to my spirits that at least there are some people that can be decent and not politicize everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially since she's a you know she's just a, a city councilor. She's not even like a you know major major oh. state player. So therefore, there's really she wasn't scoring political points. Yeah, she was exactly. just genuinely it's, it's, being decent. Correct. Mm-hmm. And she was just generally doing her job and standing up for her city. If the governor is coming over and wanting to help, let him help. Who cares what his party is? If he wants to help and if he ends up not helping, then yeah, go after him. You know, I've I got no problem with that, as 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 you pointed out. Mm-hmm. But I, I didn't see anything about that. I mean, I I heard I heard bits and pieces pieces of the speech and the delivery wasn't great, but it also wasn't a particularly bad speech. It just it wasn't particularly moving. Uh, it was was my take on it. Maybe other people had different takes on it and, fo- and followed it differently. But uh, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, yeah. The, it this is yeah. This is just divisive and crappy. But uh, shall we talk about something unifying? Yes, please. So this is a very very interesting story, and like everybody has been sending this one to me because it is based out of Massachusetts, uh, which is in itself is shocking is that a Massachusetts judge has ruled in favor of the second amendment. And, uh, Aaron and I were talking about this, this, this case a little bit beforehand in the, the, uh, and actually I was telling her, I heard uh, Jake Fogelman talking about this on the reload podcast, uh, uh, today. And, uh, and he was mentioning that he was trying to f- hammer out some of the details of the actual arrest and, and, uh, criminal complaint, that led to this, uh, you know, this appeal, uh, and he was unable to find a lot of it, but, uh, essentially, um, uh, uh, this gentleman, uh, his name is Dean Donnell. Uh, he's a resident of New Hampshire and he was traveling in Massachusetts and he was at least suspected of driving drunk. I, 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 again, the, the details are thin. I don't, I don't want to dive too deep into it, but, in in the instant well i do want to point out that that i tried to dig for details other than the the judge's statement and i couldn't find it Uh, i asked you and you couldn't find it and you even said that uh egghead looked and couldn't find it not that i think that there's any sort of grand conspiracy but it's just i we couldn't find the details here but from a footnote it really seems like he was arrested for um driving um uh, under the influence and he had a gun and bullets with him so you know i mean i'm not saying that's exactly what the charge was i don't know if it was as simple as he just went over the border went whoops turned around and then was caught or if he was you know deep inside massachusetts i don't know i can't find out if anyone knows let me know yeah, and this this trial was being done in Middlesex County, and like I said, Mid- Middlesex County starts just like north of Boston, and then kind of snakes uh, northwest all the way up to the New Hampshire border. It's a pretty large county. It's I actually find it pretty hilarious that like I uh, I, I moved I moved to Massachusetts to uh, to Medford. And uh, and I've been like moving, heading my way north, closer and closer to New Hampshire every time I moved, and uh, uh, and it seems that uh, and, and I'm still I'm still in Middlesex County every time I've moved. I've never lived in any other county in Massachusetts, uh, but um, but yeah. So it happened in Middlesex County. So it could have been this could have happened anywhere from directly over the border to you know right outside of Boston. I think Cambridge is in Middlesex. Uh, certainly Medford is, uh, so it could, it could have happened like right, right within sight of Boston as well. Uh, but the, uh, but he, he was, he was stopped. He had, he had a firearm and ammunition. Uh, Massachusetts happens to be one of the two, I think the, I think only Illinois is the only other one that requires a permit to own any firearm whatsoever. 
And so he was in direct violation of uh, Massachusetts law for having, uh, a, you know, gun and ammunition on there. And uh, uh, Mr. Donnell uh, appealed uh, this conviction under Second Amendment grounds. And the judge agreed to state that, hey, if you're crossing an essentially an imaginary line and certainly many state borders, you know, there are some that have the benefit of, of, of there being, you know, rivers or mountain passes or things like that that are that are used as the dividing line. But in most state boundaries, crossing between one and another is uh, is is imperceptible. And, you know, in some instances like, uh, oh, what was that uh, woman's name who she lived in uh, uh, Philadelphia and accidentally crossed into New Jersey? Uh, Oh, I don't remember her name either, but I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yep. And she just she ended up getting pardoned. And uh, I beg I please beg our pardon for for forgetting your name. But Aaron and I are are uh, are uh, terrible at names. And I I didn't think think of this story until we started recording. So Uh, but uh but yeah, she. But uh, it's it could be super duper easy to cross a state line without even realizing it and find yourself from a place that recognizes your permit or or a place in this case it's New Hampshire, which is permitless, to a state that uh, that 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 uh, has very very onerous permit require requirements. And uh, yeah, and Shanine Allen. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, Shanine Allen. Um, so again, she just she just accidentally crossed into New Jersey. She was licensed to carry in uh, Pennsylvania, obviously not licensed to carry in New Jersey, and uh, and got pulled over and uh, uh, and and ended up getting you know charged with with illegal carrying of a firearm, and thankfully that got uh, I believe she got pardoned, but. Uh, uh, but yeah, in this case, uh, he challenged it and, uh, the judge absolutely agreed that, uh, I don't think it has it in this article, but I remember hearing uh, someone else covering it, pointing out the fact that there's a mall where the, where the majority of it is in, uh, is in New Hampshire, but one of the anchor stores actually crosses over slightly into, into Massachusetts, uh, uh, you know, you know, where, you know, uh, crosses, crosses into Massachusetts. And so in theory, you could be walking down an aisle, browsing stuff with your concealed weapon and be perfectly legal. And then suddenly cross a line that is absolutely imaginary. There's nothing there and suddenly be in violation of the law. And then there's just the, the sheer dumbness of the fact that, Hey, I have a Massachusetts concealed weapons permit and I and the majority of my family lives in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, and so I frequently am driving north into Maine or Vermont or uh, or New Hampshire, and I'm carrying my gun, and I don't care because well, originally I had permits for those states. I've actually let them lapse because they've gone constitutional carry, so I don't feel the need to justify all the extra money, but. Uh, um, so I, you know, I could just drive into the state of Maine. I can drive into the state of New Hampshire. I could d- drive into Vermont and they don't care. I, I, I'm legal to own my guns. So therefore I'm legally carry them. But if I'm to drive South into Connecticut or Rhode Island, then no, I'm not allowed to carry there. Not, not with my, not, not constitutionally and not with my Massachusetts permit. And that makes absolutely zero sense. So, yes, Shanine Allen was pardoned by uh, Governor Christie in 2017. Excellent. I'm just here being Robin Quivers to your Howard Stern. <laughs> and you're amazing at it, Aaron. But, yeah, this <laughs> will this will most certainly get appealed and there'll there'll be a secondary challenge and we'll see where it goes. But the interesting thing about it is that we we've talked on multiple occasions about the uh, Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act that should have been signed into law by Donald Trump per all of his campaign promises. And uh, I'm not in the least bit sore about that. Uh, But Mm -hmm. of course that one would, you know, exercise essentially the full faith and credit. If you are, if you can legally carry in your, in, in, in your, in your home state, then you should be able to cross state borders no differently than you can when driving a vehicle. I 
you know, I've I <laughs> just just uh, just just this spring I drove from I drove from Massachusetts down to Virginia, and while I I could I I could not carry my gun, I had to have my gun secured in a way compliant with the uh, the firearms owner prote- owners protection act. Uh, in, in that instance, I was allowed to drive the vehicle across every state line and into uh, all sorts of different states and the District of Columbia. Uh, so the the idea that my driver's license is good from state to state to state, including the state of New Jersey that has their silly no left hand turn rules and you, you can't pump your own gas. I should, you know, I should be able to carry my firearm as well, because what is the harm? Why? Why do I suddenly become a bad guy when I cross into Connecticut or Rhode Island? Mm-hmm. What I really like about this is, uh, you know, the, the closing paragraphs uh, of this opinion. And you're right; it probably will be appealed. But given the strength of this opinion and the the Bruin decision, it'll be hard to overturn. Um, the judge writes, this court can think of no other constitutional right which a person loses simply by traveling beyond his home state's border into another state, continuing to exercise that right, and instantaneously becomes a felon subject to mandatory minimum sentence of incarceration, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, to hold otherwise would inexplicably treat Second Amendment rights differently than other individually held rights. This is fantastic. It really is. Yeah, it's fantastic. And again, we might get concealed carry reciprocity simply by means of the, the Constitution, put, putting putting a different spin to constitutional carry. So this would be very, <laughs> very interesting and uh, and very good. So hopefully that will will continue and uh, and, and, our, and our and our string of good luck doesn't uh, doesn't fail. Uh, so. I mean, I would dispute the string of good luck, but okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, yes. I, I will. I will admit, for gun laws, yeah, no, we we have had some good stuff, but I I feel, um, you know, it's it's been you know shoots and roundabouts, and yeah, we have won more than we have lost, but I think we're, I don't know, sixty forty, no more than seventy thirty. I mean- I mean, you're, uh, you're not wrong. It was, it was cynical right now. <laughs> it was it wasn't long ago that I was talking about Massachusetts fielding in a closed door session the most you know egregious and draconian gun control bill ever written in the in the United States and ever considered. And so the you're you're right, and and of course, obviously, we've got the the nice Serpa versus Bruin and. Uh, and Bruin and the and the rest of the uh, people of New York are simply not obeying that decision. So you're, you're you're not wrong. I am being a little bit of a Pollyanna on on the string of good luck. It's the string of good luck is is is, is in the law books, but it's not necessarily in the you know in the in in the practice and the lives of the people in these oppressive states. Mm-hmm. So that's fair. So, but uh, yeah, but but either way, let's. I mean, it's I'm. I want this war to be over. <laughs> I want to not have to do this podcast anymore. Because one of those like, oh yeah, no, we won. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in my lifetime. But, uh, but it it would be really nice to uh, to, to 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 run the ball down the field quite a bit because uh, the Second Amendment means what it says. Now this last little bit is really kind of a a, a taste from Bizarro World, uh, and I and uh, I. I was I was talking about this with somebody else and they came up with a very very interesting note which is Kyle Rittenhouse is currently being sued the, the title is Kyle Rittenhouse is sued by the estate of criminal he shot in self defense and I thought for sure this would be the estate of skateboard guy the guy who ran up to hit hit mm-hmm. Kyle with the skateboard and 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 took around in the chest and passed away and uh and that guy had. I thought skateboard guy. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, for some reason, I thought skateboard guy was the guy who lost his bicep. No, that no, that was he. He had a Glock in his hand. He was he 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 was he was gonna shoot. He was gonna he was gonna shoot Kyle execution style. Right. Thankful, thankfully, he hesitated okay. and uh, and uh, and now is forever crippled and deserves it. Um, but uh, but in the case of uh, but the the guy with the. 
the guy with the skateboard, he had a criminal history. He was not a good person and uh and was certainly not up to any good I, that I wanna night. say it was domestic abuse and uh in the I, I wanna say he had a record for domestic abuse. I'm sorry you cut out. I wanna say I wanna say he had a record for domestic abuse. He did. He did. Yep. He uh yep. Yes, there was the, uh, yeah, and there was, obviously, there was a very, very interesting angle is that there was a GoFundMe for his family, and I believe it was being, uh, it was being uh, uh, done in the benefit to his current girlfriend, and not the woman who he had fathered a child with and beaten the tar out of, which would have been, you know, at least a little bit of justice uh, in the world, but... uh, I don't know, but it, it turns out. But either way, he he had a he had a, a, a you know a criminal record for domestic abuse. Uh, but it you know that's a you know it was it's it's kind of a debatable level. But no, this is the this mm-hmm. is the family of uh, uh, Joseph Rosenbaum, who w- was convicted of multiple sexual assault to young children and served a number of years in prison for that Uh, much of it was, was in solitary because of poor behavior while in prison. And then he had outstanding. The article does state most of his adult life. So they don't give a hard number, but when you you see someone spent most of his adult life in prison, um, that's a, uh, that's an indicator there. And yeah, for sexual contact with five preteen boys, so a really sterling example of an individual. Yeah, in, ca- in case you want to get the Whoopi Goldberg defense, if you, if you know, you know. No, it was it was it was forcible contact. It was it was it was as bad as you imagine. And uh, yeah, and uh, as a as an added benefit of that of the they state right here the uh, 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 seventeen-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse shot three men, killing two in self-defense during a Black Lives Matter protest. Uh, now the estate is uh, is suing Kyle, uh, or oh, they, they don't, they don't. I, I I'm sorry, I, I, I misread. I, well, I think maybe one of the other articles that I've read on this refers to him as a, as as a Black Lives Matter protest. Uh, very, very interesting because some of his last words were screaming the N word at the uh, at at protesters. So. That's a that that that's that's a nice little touch of irony, but essentially his father is suing Kyle for the wrongful death of his son, and uh, that's a spicy meatball, <laughs> because uh, I no, normally well, you'll see these instances being done for uh, someone who is no build on this. But by, by the way, let, let's not bury the lead. This is a great reason for you to have some form of concealed carry, quote unquote, insurance. It may not necessarily be insurance, more than likely shouldn't be insurance whatsoever. Um but uh this uh much m- many of the policies out there will protect you from this form of lawsuit. Uh but most of the time when I've heard about the family suing suing for civil damages in the case of a wrongful death was when uh when s- somebody shot somebody claimed it was in self defense the police saw it and agreed with their assessment and 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 chose to no bill them and they were not charged so therefore there was no trial there was no charges leveled it was simply this person shot that person and the police didn't do anything about it. No charges were filed, and that was the end of it. And so then they're being brought to court. In this case, Kyle went through a full trial, and it was deemed that he was justified in shooting all three of the people that he shot, and uh, and and also he was being charged with shooting at a fourth person that uh, that the they called him Jump Kick Man. The, the person's actual name is, is is known, and this person was a very bad actor. This person was actually in prison for a violent crime at the time of uh, of of Kyle's trial, and they kept it him very low key so as that he wouldn't get called in in an orange jumpsuit to testify because that would have looked very very bad for the prosecution. Um, but uh, 
Uh, but they they charged him for all these and deemed all of them justified. And Kyle got off, and and we were very pleased to see that because this was one of the most documented instances of self defense pretty much in human history. The number of angles and videos that exist of of these shootings is amazing, and it's been a really good learning experience for those on those of us in the self-defense community just to see you know what's what and what makes it legal and what makes it illegal what was good what was bad about all of this so that it's going to be pseudo wrongful death but kyle has been cleared by a jury of his peers and a judge in um you know in the killing of mr rosenbaum so therefore the idea that it's a wrongful death seems like that's going to be a real sticky wicket but uh, a friend of mine mentioned which was interesting what's he suing him for loss of wages that that's often uh the um uh the measure for which they will rule on what the damages are you know in you know in the event that you know my wife is killed the the money that she would be supplying and 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 security that she'd be supplying to my family would be one way to add a monetary value to what has been taken away from me and mr rosenbaum had like just been released from a psychiatric hospital like that day he was still wearing the discharge bracelet and uh for those that followed the the video he threw a bag at kyle and that bag was the hospital bag where they kept his effects and had given to him when he was discharged. And so, like, this person is not a person that's going to be making money or being a productive member of society. This person is going to be, if if Kyle hadn't shot him, the chances of, I mean, he had an outstanding warrant at the time of his death. Uh, he was, you know, committing arson and violence and uh, just all sorts of awful things uh, at the time of his death. And so the idea that he might stay out of prison seems like a pretty slim bet. And so, yeah, I, I, I wonder if the judge will say as far as the, the civil asset, Kyle Rittenhouse saved us hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we'll, we'll build a family. Mm. Well, there's also the fact that this is, a pretty clear example of throw crap at the wall and see what sticks mm -hmm. because not only is Rosenbaum's father suing Rittenhouse, but he is also suing the local sheriff's department, the city of Kenosha, the city of West Allis for reasons I don't understand, uh, Kenosha officials, and several counties for compensatory and punitive damage for the wrongful death of Rosemary. He's suing everyone he can possibly sue. I, I don't think this is going to win because when you spread a net that wide, you don't have a case. You're just hoping someone gives up and settles. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, this is, it's, it's absolutely insane. And so the good news is I think if, um, if this is a, if this is a civil trial, I don't think uh, uh, Kyle or any of these other people actually need to appear in court. They can just have their representative come and and represent their in, uh, interests, uh, which would be awfully nice. Just said send 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 in, send in the lawyers and send me an email when it's done, uh, so that you know, especially Kyle. I mean, he's such a such such a young man who's was really made into political fodder uh over 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 all of this uh I, I would i would i would love to see at least a little bit of a benefit for him where at least he wouldn't have to go into the court to fight this and or be tempted to settle because yeah this is one of those things of the this should be spanked and i don't know if uh if uh, wisconsin has uh some of the laws that several other states have as far as frivolous lawsuits and uh, being able to uh, counter sue for uh, for frivolity and getting your uh, your legal fees paid for. I mean, I would think that if any one um, defendant has a chance of of losing, it would possibly be um, 
the, the various entities involved in Kenosha, which more or less, and I don't want to start off a fight, but could be accused of allowing the riot to happen rather than going in and quashing it. Uh, that at least is a case, uh, as opposed to, well, Rittenhouse has already been proven in a court of law with much more stringent rules uh, of his innocence. I mean, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I'm going to say it's going to be really, really difficult, especially, as you say, with all of the video uh, evidence and all of the eyewitness testimony. Mm -hmm. So I think he's going to be OK. But I, I, so well. I also think some sort of polity, perhaps multiple ones, may just decide to settle. Yeah. I mean, that's always that's that's always the hope. I mean, that certainly happened with all of the um, the gun companies that got sued in the 90s. Um, so many of them looked at the looked at the numbers. I mean, again, we we followed the Lucky Gunner case very, very closely when they were sued by um, by the Phillips family. And uh, and and the uh, I mean, what a what a soap opera that was. But essentially, they got it dismissed with prejudice fairly early in the you know, in the case in pretrial. It never actually went to, went to trial. It just got dismissed, and they were out over a quarter of a million dollars, just essentially building up to the case. So, the yeah, these these cases can get extremely expensive, and God knows how much Kyle Rittenhouse's trial cost. It was a lot. I think it was millions, uh, and or at least a million dollars. It was a lot, a lot of money, and uh, and so. Yeah, it's it, it can it can it it can make it can make dollars and cents, if not moral sense, to settle. So, uh, pivoting from making sense to making no sense, we have once again uh, a patented weird audio fisk. Last week, he talked about the book American Carnage and uh, the laughter it brought him. Uh, this week, he fisks a statement by one of the authors of that rag, Fred Guttenberg. So in a previous show, I gave a brief review of the book American Carnage, written by Thomas Gabor and Fred Gutenberg. As I said then, it's a book filled with talking points of the anti-gun agenda and frequent shameless contradictions. I've fisked Dr. Gabor on the Gunblog Variety cast and on my blog, but I've never fisked Mr. Gutenberg. Well, my time has come. He was on the Brady Campaign podcast promoting his book, link in the show notes. Fred shared the stage with two other gun prohibition activists, Christian Hain and Liz Dunning. But to say he shared the stage would be really overly generous. And their role was little more than to tell their stories and inject some talking points. So this Fisk will be 100% Fred. If you don't know who Fred Gutenberg is, I'll let him introduce himself. Yeah, hi. I'm Fred Guttenberg. I'm in a truly honored to be on this with all of you, a, a group of people who I truly love and also wish I never knew. I know you all because of gun violence. It's going to be five years now that uh, my children were in the Parkland school shooting. My daughter, Jamie, died that day. She was murdered. And my son, Jesse, um, lives with the after effects and the consequences of that day every single day since. And because of what happened to my family, I've become very active in the world of trying to reduce gun violence and become very connected with the work that everyone at Brady is doing and thankful to be fortunate enough to work on it with you. I've said this many times before. I will be doing nothing here to belittle what has happened to the Gutenberg family. It's horrible, and I wish it on nobody. That being said, having a tragic event happen in your family is not a free pass for horrible behavior. And Fred, like Manuel Oliver, who also lost a child in the Parkland shooting, is in the business of overlooking the massive incompetence, cowardice, and sloth of the FBI, the Broward County Sheriff's Office, and the Broward County School System that all allowed the killer in that shooting to escalate his violent and antisocial behavior unchallenged until he committed mass murder and then failed to do their jobs and stop him once he started killing classmates and allow the EMTs to treat the wounded. Many, like the victims at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, could have been saved had the police followed department protocols. Blaming the guns for this tragic event is intellectually lazy and proven to be ineffective. 
And for that, I cannot let Mr. Gutenberg's lies go unchallenged. But I'm wondering, Fred, what prompted you to write this book with Thomas and, and why kind of now? Actually, the timing was perfect. You know, when Jamie was killed, I, I didn't really know a whole lot about the world of gun violence. I knew it existed. I knew too many people died. I knew there was a gun lobby. I knew there was debates over who should or shouldn't have guns, but I didn't know enough. And over the next couple of years, I embarked on this phase of wanting to do something about gun violence. And, and, and it was immediate. You start encountering the lies that have led to not just people who then communicate those lies, but actually influence public policy with those lies as the foundation of what they do. Interesting that he started his journey knowing nothing about gun violence. Spoiler alert, that status hasn't changed. Also, can we savor the irony that he's saying, I knew there was a gun lobby, while he's on the podcast run by the once great Brady campaign, the corporate lobby that helped write and pass the federal assault women's ban, the single most devastating piece of gun control that this nation has ever experienced. And Fred worked directly with March for Our Lives, which is a subsidiary of every town, which of course is Michael Bloomberg's personal anti-gun corporate lobby and the largest gun control group in the United States. They rail against groups like the NRA and the National Shooting Sports Foundation, but don't want to talk about their own corporate ties. And I'm not really sure I ever have seen the most of a, a way for those who want to save lives from gun violence to have the tools to combat those lies and to message against those lies. And so about a year, year and a half ago, uh, Thomas reached out to me to let me know of a project that he wanted to start working on. And it was this book. And it just, it seemed a perfectly natural thing to do. And our hope is that we put an end to the lies, that we stop the BS. Just to recap, I own the book and read it. And it's deeply dishonest. There are many things stated in the book that are factually untrue. There is cherry-picked data and mischaracterizations of data to make the gun prohibition agenda seem effective. And almost every major point in the book is directly contradicted when they try to disprove the next talking point of the Second Amendment supporters. You would have expected someone like me to have given this book a one-star review on Amazon. But in fact, because it made me laugh out loud so many times for such ham-handed attempts to manipulate the truth, that was worth an extra star and the price I paid for it. And never mind that the lies of the gun lobby are, for the most part, true. But you know what? If we're going to have a debate on gun violence, let's do it. But let's work with facts and, and let's stop allowing those who have pushed lies to the point where we now have 400 million guns in America and over 40,000 deaths, it's time to fix this. They want to have a debate on gun violence. Said on an anti-gun podcast, I did a quick Google search, and the closest I found to Mr. Gutenberg debating the issue was that he stood up to Marco Rubio at a town hall event. And to call Senator Rubio a champion of the Second Amendment would be extremely charitable. Second Amendment activists would love to debate the issue with key players in the anti-gun lobby, like Mr. Gutenberg. But gun prohibitionists are unwilling to go anywhere but friendly stages. Hell, recently, Colian Noir accepted a debate against David Hogg. Except when the camera hog found out that Colian Noir was his opponent, he found somewhere else to be. The book American Carnage is full of lies and contradictions that are so easily challenged that any challenge simply cannot be allowed. And to claim that Mr. Gutenberg or Dr. Gabor wish to debate the issue is yet another lie they tell. And there's a real world example of how it works, okay? Because for those who didn't hear the press conference in Florida, the Florida Speaker of the House and a whole bunch of sheriffs talking about why they want to introduce, I'm calling it untrained carry, they're calling it constitutional carry, but they actually use as an example of why we need this, they said, because there are too many people with guns leaving them unlocked in cars, and then they get taken, and we need more untrained people ready to take down those who stole the unlocked gun in the car. 
Okay. Rather than dealing with the fact that we ought to be dealing with reality, there's already too many people with too many unlocked guns in the car, and we have no safe storage requirements. Okay. And we're only going to add to it. Here is a great example of how Fred sees the world. This is a huge problem with concealed carry. If you take personal defense seriously, you want to carry a gun everywhere. Except gun-free zones exist, and in some places, they're everywhere. What do you do if you're traveling to a gun-free zone? I used to work for an employee that forbid any weapons, and I commuted on the train. That meant I didn't put on a gun in the morning, walked to the train station, took the train, walked to my lab, worked my job. I had to go the whole day unarmed. If you drive, most states protect your right to leave your gun in your car and even allow you to have your gun in your car without a carry permit. But Fred's right. Storing guns in cars is a horrible compromise. Some people like just to tuck it in the center console or the glove box where it could be stolen in a smash and grab or have a trigger lock or a lock box. Then the gun can be stolen with the locking device and removed at the thief's leisure. Even if you bolt a hard-sided safe to the floorboards, it's not like cars are never stolen. The logical solution is that if a person is trusted to carry on the street outside, let them carry inside, even if that's a courthouse or a school or a post office. Fred's solution is just don't carry. That seems like a reasonable compromise. But people don't understand how people will take the facts or actually alternative facts lies and use them to drive policy, even though it makes things worse and more dangerous. A little Freudian slip. Like my previous Fist series on the Brady Campaign podcast, it turns out most of the lies of the Second Amendment activists are simply true. The gun prohibition movement has taken to calling them lies in hopes that people will believe them. Hence why I'm making this Fisk. And one of those myths that Fred addresses is this idea that the only consequence of gun violence is it's numerical. It's in the number of people who are killed or you know, the number of people who are injured. But we know that there are considerable psychological and economic costs for survivors, as well as sort of these social and personal costs, which unfortunately, because of what we were just talking about, each of you on this call as survivors have personally experienced. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that aspect, this myth of well, gun violence is sort of very narrowly defined versus who it actually is impacting and how. This is a total straw man argument. Has anybody claimed that Fred or Manuel Oliver have not suffered from gun violence, despite not actually being shot themselves? We all know veterans suffer greatly from the wounds and experience they received overseas. Why would anyone think people who are simply connected to gun violence or were shot and not killed would not have similar effects? Meanwhile, Fred defends the actions of the gun prohibition movement in his book, defending the use of suicide numbers to pump up the gun death numbers, all while pushing things for like bans on assault weapons and magazines, but nothing that would change actual suicides. They didn't even mention that if you dial 988, just like if you dial 911 on any phone, it will connect you with a suicide prevention counselor. That's literally the least I can do to help. And it was too much for these ghouls to do in their own book. Your life or the life of somebody you love is worth it. I don't see humans as numbers, but I can't say the same about Fred or the Brady campaign. It's also good for sales. Okay. And so we need to defeat that. Never, ever, ever forget the NRA response to Sandy Hook. Okay. Because they used it as a gun sales bonanza. Their response, I don't think it was more than four days, maybe five days after Sandy Hook, was the very, very first time you ever heard the line. The only thing that defeats a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. It was a full week, as the NRA has a seven-day blackout before making a statement about a major event. At least they used to. I don't hear much from them these days. But look at recent spree killers. Nashville is a great example of prompt police engagement and minimal loss of life. The events where the shooter picks a place where armed citizens are, like the Greenwood Park Mall in Indiana, the shooting ends before it even becomes a mass killing, thanks to the quick action of a good guy with a gun, in this case, Eli Dickin. Or the church shooting in White Settlement, which was quickly brought to a halt due to the brave actions of Jack Wilson and Richard White. Further, 
when the good guys do nothing, like in Parkland and Uvalde, the body counts skyrocket. So say what you will, Fred, but good guys with guns sure do come in handy when bad guys are about. As for the sales bump after the mass shooting, this is true, but it isn't a response to the shooting, but a response to the fact that the anti-gun lobby always calls for gun bans in the wake of shootings. Even in shootings like Parkland, where law enforcement admitted mistakes in handling the event. Nope, just ignore that admission and push to ban guns and punish people that weren't even there. The, the amendment before the second is the first, the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And and my daughter's First Amendment rights, her Second Amendment rights, and everything thereafter have been terminated because of this bastardized notion of the Second Amendment. So nice of Fred to attack our constitutional rights without having actually read the Constitution himself. Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is in the Declaration of Independence. The First Amendment reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or the press, or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And while it's of little comfort to Mr. Gutenberg, nobody has the right to take a life of others or steal or damage their property. Hence why, despite Second Amendment protections, the man who killed Mr. Gutenberg's daughter will spend the rest of his life in prison. When they say the Second Amendment isn't an absolute right, this is what that really means. And this whole notion of tying it to freedom is infuriating because for those of us who have lost loved ones, there is no freedom from the grave. And so it's really infuriating. This is a chapter in his book. He and Tom claim that we're more free if the government takes our rights away. There's another book that says that too. It says, war is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. Fred and Tom seem to be doing a great job of pushing the last two of those Orwellian tenants. Here's the thing. There is no risk to the Second Amendment by calling for safety measures to reduce the rate of gun violence. And in fact, this country's history, all the way up until 1977, is as a country with gun owners and gun safety. There's lots of gun safety in this country's history. FYI, his definition of Gun safety is banning guns and banning carry. They don't care about actual gun safety so much that they won't endorse any safety training at all. By the way, the up to 1977 line is another subtle lie. It changed in 1977 with this guy, Harlan Carter, who, Carter, who took over the NRA and transformed them into what they have since become. And the thing about Harlan Carter that everyone needs to know he was also a convicted murderer and he changed a vowel in his name so it wasn't known okay but that's who transformed the nra and this argument into what you see today it's only since 1977 it's not through this country's history 1977 was the year of the cincinnati revolt where nra members tossed out the board of directors who had worked with the government to pass the Gun Control Act of 1968 and had become very friendly with gun restrictions. For him to say this is a change away from gun safety is laughable. First, the NRA is the number one firearms trainer in the nation, even today with all their legal issues. Second, accidental gun injuries and deaths are exceedingly rare and have been in steep decline for as long as records have been kept. Last... This is the latest anti-gun talking point, that the Cincinnati Revolt was a radicalization of the NRA and gun culture as a whole. But in fact, the NRA was founded after the Civil War by Union generals wanting to improve the marksmanship for future conscripts in the event that we needed another major draft. So the NRA was founded as a paramilitary group in the 19th century. It wasn't until after World War II that shell-shocked troops started focusing more on hunting and sports shooting than martial and defensive shooting, and started entertaining the idea of gun control. These were the radicals in the NRA, and they were thrown out in 77, not the other way around. Further, Harlan Carter was convicted of murder. But that conviction was overturned because the judge failed to give proper jury instructions about self-defense. So, he wasn't a murderer. He just killed in self-defense. So, this was another lie. So, we are a, through the history of this country, a gun safety country. That's the truth. 
And the Second Amendment wasn't at risk then. It isn't at risk now. Freedom Part, really is. Like, but freedom, freedom is. Really at risk right and now. Let's, and let's use one of their lives because they talk about this. If we do right. anything to save lives, we're on a slippery slope. Honestly, we spent a lot less time with gun safety in the years before Jeff Cooper penned the four rules of gun safety. And while pro 2A groups do promote gun safety and safe gun handling, groups like the Brady Campaign, Everytown, Giffords exist solely to ban guns and restrict our rights. And on that slippery slope. Well, you know what? Five years ago, when Jamie was killed, 300 million weapons in America. Now, five years later, over 400 million plus ghost guns and an increasing gun violence death rate. That's the slippery slope. We keep listening to the lies, adding more weapons, and more people are dying. That's the slippery slope. The numbers he cites are deeply suspect. Some of the most well-armed states are the safest, and gun control is often a corollary to violent crime increasing, and relaxing laws often correlate with violent crime dropping. Meanwhile, we've talked about how the ATF's definition of ghost guns make most plumbing supply stores and hardware stores gun shops by essentially claiming that anything that can be into a gun receiver at a machine shop during a full workday is a firearm. Places like California and Massachusetts keep expanding their definition of salt weapons to include more and more mundane firearms. And places like Delaware, New Jersey, and Washington are passing their own bans. All for no improvement in public safety. So keep calling the truth a lie, Fred. Hey, listen, that has been the solution that has followed all instances of gun violence now for the past 10, 20 years. It hasn't worked. It's brought more gun violence. And, and you know, it, it has also normalized the idea that we should anticipate gun violence. And because we need to anticipate it, because we've armed so many people, that we now need to arm more just in case. Oh, and by the way, while we're at it, let's send parents home with DNA test kits in case their kids get caught in the crossfire. Say for the time around the pandemic lockdowns, violent crime has been steadily declining since the peak in the early 90s. This both includes the federal assault wounds ban and its repeal and the boom in concealed carry, as well as the AR-15 becoming the most popular rifle in America. So more lies. As for the DNA test kits, I've never heard of it. My daughter's in school. And it would be an amazing waste of time and resources as school shootings are alarmingly rare and the number of kids killed is very small as well. So why bother with all that testing? Talking about army, all these people in schools, what the reality of the numbers of actual instances of gun violence in schools is not very high, only guarantees you will have more gun violence in schools. You have accidental gun violence in schools. You will have more people who will leave a gun unattended or who will hear a book drop and panic. This talk I consider child abuse. I remember watching the news coverage of the Parkland shooting and seeing students saying, I knew it was only a matter of time before our school was shot up. Yes, Parkland did have a shooting, but there are thousands of kids who have been exposed to this horrific rhetoric who are afraid to go to school because they are told that school shootings happen every day and it's only a matter of time before they go into lockdown and witness unthinkable horrors. Meanwhile, think about all the shootings that happen at schools that don't ban firearms. Oh, yeah, there haven't been any. One of the ones that actually drives me crazy, because it seems to be one that they embrace a whole lot, is this notion of defensive gun uses. Um, It drives me crazy because they truly, they use lies. I mean, outright lies. And, 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 and BS data and one of the biggest purveyors of the BS data literally created a fake person to support the data. Okay. Of uh, John Lott. We all know what he did. Okay. Just so they could continue pushing the lie. Yes. John Lott used a sock puppet to talk up his work on gun forms. But when President Obama authorized the biggest CDC study on gun violence in U.S. history, it found that there is likely more defensive gun uses than gun violence of any kind in the U.S. every year. And they didn't cite lot. They also really didn't cite the study much because when the data didn't come out the right way, they just stopped talking about it. And when I sit around and I talk to my 22-year-old son and his friends, 
they all believe it's like, look at what's going on in America today. We need guns to defend ourselves is what kids talk about. They buy into it. And it's fantasy. Well, I guess as hard as you lie, the truth will always prevail. The information age makes it a lot harder to lie, especially when you could take your phone out and go right to the show notes and look at my references. Since I read the paper book, I couldn't click on the footnotes of Fred's book. But I will note that at least three quarters of his references come from anti-gun lobby groups like Everytown, Brady, Johns Hopkins, Bloomberg School, Giffords, and the Gun Violence Policy Center, as well as researchers like Kellerman, Wintermute, Winkler, Hemingway, and of course, anti-gun authors whom I've fist in the past, like Mike, the gun guy, Weiser, and Tom Gabor himself. It takes a ton of effort to lie that much. It must be exhausting. And by the way, the data shows that the states that have embraced that lie and changed their gun laws the most have significantly higher rates of per capita gun violence than the blue states. Not true, but Fred Gutenberg is not a fan of honesty or the truth. Just look at his book. Links are in the show notes. Those are your anti-gun talking points and a few rebuttals to combat them. So overall weird, I thought that one was pretty good. Um, the only reason I'm, I'm not giving you higher praise is because you were basically dynamiting fish in a barrel. Uh, <laughs> his arguments were so weak that uh, it, it really didn't need a whole lot of, of effort to demolish them, but you demolished them quite expertly. Yeah, the, the, the book is equally as weak and now that i am done this because that that's the as i as i was listening to this podcast this podcast came out before the book even even hit the shelves i actually pre-ordered the book as soon as i finished listening to the podcast i'm like i need to read this this was so ridiculous i want to see what else is going on and obviously he wrote it with tom gabor who i've i i, I have followed extensively as well and uh, is is equally full of crap um so i pre-ordered the book uh, it, it, it came in, uh, I thought I had just ordered it on Kindle, but I got the, uh, I, I, I got the, uh, the paperback and, uh, and now, now that I've done the Fisk for his, uh, uh, for, for that, for that podcast appearance, I don't think I need this book anymore. So you know what I'm going to do? What are you going to do? Weird. I'm, I'm not going to hold a contest. I'm not going to, I am going to simply say, Hey, message me on Patreon. And, uh, if you are interested in this book. And, uh, yeah, just shoot me a, shoot me a message on Patreon and, uh, and then, uh, uh, and then, and then give me, give me an address and I will, uh, I'll make it happen. And I don't know if you want any, me to do anything silly to the book or anything like that, I'll do that too. I'm like, if you want me to sign <laughs> Fred Guttenberg's book, I'll do that. I don't know. But uh, either way, let let me know. I'll 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 send this book to you. I've actually uh, there have been several anti gun books that I have that I have read that have made their way around the country from various Second Amendment supporters and not doing opposition research. Welcome to Independent Thoughts with yours truly, Xander Opal. I've touched on how right to repair meets the right to keep and bear arms before. Today I'm going into another aspect where both of these issues intersect. Time. When a farmer's tractor, planter, combine, chopper, or other piece of equipment fails, it absolutely must be fixed immediately. Putting off harvest results in a chance for the top layer of feed in a silo or pile to sour, rain to ruin hay, or wheat to start sprouting on the stalk. When tillage is delayed, so is planting, resulting in a lower yield or even a lost crop. This is all in service of feeding animals and people. The latter, both directly and indirectly, as hay is what food eats. Even more so, if there's a power outage, a farm often uses a tractor to run a generator rather than a dedicated engine. It is useful to have a generator on a trailer a tractor can move from site to site for construction and repairs. That generator is used to power wells and motors that deliver the ingredients for animal feed that keep the critters happy and healthy and alive. Again, if something breaks, it has to be fixed yesterday. A farmer can't wait for a dealership to see if a technician can make it out, which can be delayed because a repair on someone else's piece of equipment took longer than expected. It happens. It's understandable. That doesn't remove the need for a farmer to have options to take care of it himself. Not to mention, it can cost several hundred dollars for a repair tech to just show up. 
The need to be able to take care of problems in the field yourself is just like being able to defend yourself. In fact, being able to defend yourself with effective tools is even more important and immediate. Most folks can't afford to pay the salary of an armed bodyguard, just as repair techs are incredibly expensive to call in for a farm that isn't a big name. And when the sugar goes down, you don't have time to wait for someone else to come take care of it for you. The problem is there, immediate, and by its nature will end you if you try to ignore it while you wait. Most of us don't wander around with a posse of armed individuals from Pinkerton or police, nor can we afford to pay gold for green, or, well, red for that matter, or blue, or orange, or tan, or light green, or white, or orange. Did I mention that one yet? Not sure if Beard will cut that out or not. Furthermore, many farmers are going to older technology where you can just pay 100 or 2 once for a shop manual and fix most of it yourself, or even buy a non-operable machine to salvage parts from as needed. This is equivalent to the Massachusetts so-called handgun safety roster, or so-called assault weapon bans, where folks are forced to use older technology and not take advantage of improvements in controllability or actual safety designs to ensure that only the threat is stopped rather than increasing the risk to bystanders. Have fun. Be safe. I hope I gave you something to think about. And, Beard, you have your work cut out for you on these links. So I thought that was a really, really good analogy on how right to repair uh, dovetailed into the Second Amendment. Didn't you think so, Aaron? I did. And yeah, the, those... The, the, the lockouts are getting like oppressive. I mean, I, the, the farm equipment, it's one of those, I, I don't really know enough about farm equipment to know. I've heard, uh, I know, uh, I, I know Xander and uh, Heinrich are frequently talking back and forth, uh, you know, in, in, in farm boyese about, uh, about the various nonsense <laughs> that's happening with farm equipment these days. And I'm, I, I can't even keep up. Uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, the, the one thing that like really bugs me is what's happening in the car industry. Uh, like I think the worst offender is Tesla where, you know, all right, you know, I've, I, I drive a Ford edge. It's an SEL, you know, they had the platinum edition when I, uh, uh, when we bought that and we elected not to spend a little bit less money and get a car with, with, with less features in it. And the features aren't there. They just aren't. <laughs> And so the, the, it's not like the car has a leather interior, but I have to pay extra money to remove the cloth seat covers from them. But yet these Teslas all have these like various features and things like that where, you know, and, you know, in some instances, okay, I, the self-driving feature, I could see that being a subscription model because that's something that constantly needs to be updated and monitored. And there's a, there's definitely a real time component. And so, paying you know paying as you go for that feature makes some sense but like you know some of these features it's it's not like you're you you need to pay extra because the parts are more expensive because the parts are in the car it's just them trying to squeeze more money out of you and it, it makes me angry uh-huh. so okay weird this idea just occurred to me and and it may be half baked but honestly what this really reminds me of it's a similar tactic uh, to the way that the gun prohibitionists are trying to kill gun culture. You know, if you prevent uh, children and teenagers from learning about guns, they're less likely to want them, and so they won't buy them when they're adults. And so similarly, by making it uh, so much harder to uh, repair vehicles, you you kill off that... Uh, repair do-it-yourself uh, culture, and so not only can you have the, you know, only our people can uh, repair them like how Apple does, but you also basically, well, well to, to make an analogy, you know, um, instead of taking uh, the, the time to change the oil yourself, you then have to t take it to the um, wherever they would take farm vehicles for whatever you, you get the idea it's half baked but but i feel like um this is an attempt to to choke off the self repair culture at the root maybe i'm just you know completely nuts here but that's 
I'm seeing some similarities here. I mean, it it I gotta say, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think it does kind of line up because I I gotta say, I, I'm I'm pissed off at like how cars are, you know, cars are being, you know, treated with added subscriptions and added money things, and you know, you have uh, I know, I know, like certain BMWs don't even have dipsticks in them. You're just supposed to trust the. Uh, you're supposed to just supposed to trust the the uh, the gauges on the dashboard, or take it there and and essentially have the service shop drain your oil, measure it, and then put it back in if you want to check the oil, uh, which just seems completely pointless and bad, and and also uh, an additional labor charge. Absolutely, and. You think about it, like the people that have like the most independent mindset are farmers. You know, farmers are again, yeah, the the they stuff breaks down in the field and they figure out ways to fix it and get stuff back together and just make it happen and make it work and uh and 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 go through it. And just there's a lot of, you know, backwoods country ingenuity that goes on on farms around the around, around the country and the idea that suddenly no you can't change the oil on your harvester no you can't you know you can't you know you know change the spark plugs and things like that that's the, the hell i can't that's what i do oh but this is more complicated cool give me a book i'll read about it and i'll fix it myself and <laughs> but and that idea of the hell i can't i'll do it myself is certainly could be an idea of i mean it's that's certainly something that goes with the gun prohibition movement is the you know the the as as i mentioned in my uh in in, in my segment talking about the look when police show up you know in, in good time like they can quash a spree killer really really fast but what happens even faster is if the spree killer shows up and the and, and concealed carriers are already there, like the white settlement church shooting. That was over in seconds. Eli Dickin, I think I think the overall statement is it took Eli Dickin 15 seconds to stop the killer there. And that's that's long. <laughs> that's a, that's a long time for for civilian uh, 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 interdiction. And so the idea of the no, I'll just do it myself. I don't need to depend on the police i'll just ha- i'll just handle it uh that's certainly a mindset that they want to squash and the idea of the oh, i'll just handle it. It, it 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 lines up i don't know if I, I don't know if we've i don't know if we've blown blown the roof off this but uh but it's it's it certainly lines up okay and now david is here to talk about the blackout round but not 300 blackout no 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 8.6 blackout <laughs> Hi, and welcome to Gun Lovers and Other Strangers. In one of my previous segments, I talked about suppressors and suppressor history, and briefly mentioned some of the cartridges and loads that are optimized for use with suppressors. In this segment, I'd like to talk about a specific cartridge developed for use in suppressed rifles. In this case, I'm not talking about the 300 Blackout, but its bigger, younger brother, the 8.6 Blackout. While the concept for the two cartridges is similar, there are some significant differences in execution. 300 Blackout is based on the 223 Remington or 5.56 by 45 mm NATO case and is trimmed and necked up to take 30 caliber bullets while retaining the same overall length of its parent case. For optimal suppressor performance, those bullets tend to weigh 200 grains or more. 8.6 Blackout is derived from the 6.5 Creedmoor case, which in turn is based on the 308 Winchester or 7.62 by 51 mm NATO case. To form the 8.6 blackout, one of these cases is trimmed and necked up to 338 caliber, and for optimal suppressor use, is loaded with bullets of 300 grains and heavier. While 308 Winchester, or 7.62 NATO cases, can be formed into 8.6 blackout brass, 6.5 Creedmoor is supposed to be a better option due to slightly greater internal volume. This is due to the 308 case having slightly thicker walls. For most shooters at moderate ranges, the difference is unlikely to be decisive. One of the more impressive differences between the 300 and 8.6 blackout cartridges is the rifling. In 300 blackout firearms, the twist rate in a standard barrel is 1 in 7 or 1 in 8, meaning a single groove of rifling will make a complete 360 degree rotation in 7 or 8 inches of barrel length. In contrast, 
the 8.6 blackout has a rifling of 1 in 3 inches, which means the inside of the barrel looks more like a threaded rod than what we're used to seeing when looking down the bore. The fast twist rate of 8.6 blackout helps stabilize the long heavy bullets, but also requires some design changes in those bullets, especially with supersonic loads. At high velocity and with such a fast twist rate, traditional jacketed bullets can potentially tear apart after exiting the barrel. This means bonded jacket or solid bullets are better choices, as they'll stay together and perform better under these circumstances. Let me take a moment to explain what's meant by bonded jacket bullets. Simply put, bonded bullets are projectiles where through an additional manufacturing process, the bullet core, usually lead, is more firmly attached to the bullet jacket, some type of copper alloy. This can be done through an electrochemical method where the jacket is basically plated over the core in multiple layers until the desired thickness is achieved. A casting process where molten lead is poured into the previously formed jackets, effectively soldering the core to the jacket, or some other proprietary process specific to that manufacturer. By using one of these methods, the jacket is secured to the core much more securely, meaning both in flight and on target, they're much more likely to stay together. Bullets that hold together better retain more weight on impact and are therefore more effective on living targets. Traditional non-bonded jacketed bullets are generally made by swaging a lead core into a preformed jacket. This is a simpler process requiring fewer manufacturing steps, so this style of bullet tends to be less expensive in comparison. Due to the relative ease of production with fewer steps where something can go wrong, many people consider non-bonded bullets to be more accurate than the bonded style. Again, as I said earlier, for most shooters at moderate ranges, the differences between the two projectile types is unlikely to be decisive in a more traditional twist rate barrel. Another side effect of the fast rifling in 8.6 blackout seems to be in penetration. Due to the rapid rotation of the bullet, it can punch through thicker targets. This is especially true when shooting solids and supersonic bullets. Of course, where this cartridge really shines is subsonic loads in a suppressed rifle. Even when shot in rifles with shorter barrels, and by shorter, I mean 12 to 14 inches, Reports are coming in that with good quality suppressors, they're hearing safe, even if not necessarily hearing comfortable. When fired from a precision bolt-action rifle, accuracy is said to be excellent, though obviously 8.6 Blackout isn't designed for the same effective range as 6.5 Creedmoor or 308 Winchester. Reportedly, it has an effective range of 300 yards with subsonic and between 4 and 600 yards with supersonic bullets. As with 300 blackout on AR-15 platforms, all it takes to switch an AR-10 to 8.6 blackout is a new barrel. The same bolt, buffer spring, and magazines can still be used. Obviously, any muzzle devices need to be capable of passing a 338 caliber bullet. Loaded ammunition is becoming more available, though still at a premium price. New empty brass is currently thin on the ground, but reloading dies from Lee, Hornady, and others are available. With a set of dies and a saw, it's not difficult to make 8.6 blackout cases out of 6.5 Creedmoor or 308 Winchester brass. For those who do intend to reload, there are plenty of good quality 338 bullets on the market thanks to cartridges like 338 Lapua and 338 Winchester Magnums. Personally, I'm hoping to get some trigger time on one of these myself, and if it's everything I've heard it is, I may wind up adding a new cartridge to my collection. Have fun and safe shooting. The Q-Fix in 8.6. Wild. I'm a big fan. That about wraps up this segment. If you have any questions for me or suggestions for future segments or a comment on a past segment, please post them on the Assorted Calibers podcast Facebook or MeWe pages and Aaron or Weird will make sure I see them. I'm also a contributor on the Blue Collar Prepping blog, which can be found at bluecollarprepping.blogspot.com. Finally, I'm a published author, and books with my stories can be found on Amazon under the names Brenna Bach and David Bach. That's all for now. Thanks for listening. I'm David, and this is Gun Lovers and Other Strangers. I, I, I gotta say, as a man who carries a 45, Garchin is like the 300 blackout, and now the 8.6 really appear to my big and slow fetish. Like, just the when I see these, like, massive bullet weights, I'm like, tell me more. What's that line? Sometimes big, fat, and slow is the way to go. <laughs> I resemble that remark. <laughs> All I gotta say is, if somebody gets hit by a dump truck, 
it's generally not a good situation to be in, but also note that the dump truck probably wasn't going that fast. <laughs> dump truck is the name you danced under in college. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you find out? <laughs> Am I on Pornhub? <laughs> <laughs> oh, play us out, Piano Cat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's get as far away from that as possible by thanking each and every one of our listeners. Thank you so much for listening to the show and putting up with Aaron and I shenanigans. <laughs> we mean well. Oh, but a very special super thanks to all our supporters on Patreon. Become a Patreon patron. Go to patreon.com slash the Surrey Calibers podcast to sign up. You can get an early release of the podcast. You can get bonus content like the hilarious blooper reels, the ACP film tracks, the ACP mag dump. And you can message me and get this book off my hands because I don't need it anymore. Uh, so apparently you can only rate podcasts on Apple. So please remember to rate us on Apple Podcasts, but subscribe to us on the platform of your choice, including Google Podcasts, uh, and share the show with your friends, both online and off. You can get more from me at my blog, which is weirdworld.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world.com. And hear me weekly on Handgun Radio on the Firearms Radio Network. Uh, And how was that episode with Tex? That was fantastic, wasn't it? Oh my God. So good. Like, not only does he have the most amazing radio voice in the history of voices, but also, oh my God, was he just, he was just ready to perform. Like, I I had a whole bunch of questions lined up on the, okay, I can ask this question, I can ask that question, that'll lead him down this rabbit hole, and we can get a show out of this, and it's just one of those, like, just get out of the way weird, it's going to be amazing. (laughs) It was. I'm so glad I got to be... Yeah, more than a fly in the wall, I did a few things, but I was mostly quiet. Um, but but other than my uh, very infrequent guest appearances on Handgun Radio, you can get more from me at Linktree slash Aaron Paulette. That's Linktree dot e forward slash Aaron Paulette, all one word. Yeah, uh, I haven't been producing much lately because uh, the past six weeks have been psychotic. Um, hopefully if some things can start going right, maybe I can get back to writing. I'd like to get back to writing, but I have got to keep the house from burning down first. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I wish you didn't, but you do have an excellent excuse. So ho- ho- hopefully that Thank excuse you. will dry up very, very quickly because, yeah, Aaron, you've, you've been through a lot. Would be nice. Yeah. And uh, thanks to Nate Spencer for our music. And also, speaking of music... Panya Oddball's wife has a uh, has a new podcast out, uh, which should be on all the places. She's just starting to roll it out right now. It's called Meowcore, <laughs> and it covers uh, it, it co- covers music, cats, and geekery. So, uh, by all means, uh, uh, go search Meowcore where where you get where all fine podcasts are sold. <laughs> I, I just think it's kind of funny that Oddball has a blog called Guns Cars Tech. And Panya has a podcast that's basically uh, cats, music, geekery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Their marriage is assorted and so's our podcast. <laughs> you know what works for me? Good night, everyone. <laughs> Good night. Good night.